Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of How's That the Cricket podcast with me, Lily, and Josh. Hello, everybody. So we are back with, look, there's been some cricket news, and there's been a couple of changing in coaches recently. A bit confusing, actually. It's been full on, that's for sure. I mean, yeah. As it's... Strikers fans, we've lost a few. Um, Jude Coleman's gone to the Aussie. Aussies mm-hmm. as a assistant and um, Charlotte Edwards has gone to full-time head coach with Sydney Sixers, which is fantastic for her. She's going to do an amazing job. Yeah, but she will be very missed within the strikers group. But yeah, Jude Coleman, hopefully we can still have her around um, because the seasons don't clash too much. But then again, who knows? Now, Sixers coach, and I believe he was Australian coach as well, Ben Sawyer, has moved over to the the White Ferns, which is, it kind of blew my mind when I saw it. Um, I was like, hang on a minute, am I reading this right or is this a prank? Yeah, no, that's, and again, amazing opportunity for him. But yeah, we'll definitely miss him for sure. I um, mean, yeah, he was one of the assistants, I believe, for the Aussie women's team. So now I'd be greatly missed again, but again, uh, great opportunity for him. But yeah, it's just like, wait a minute. Yeah, is this a prank or is this like, well, it's not April Fool's? Yeah, yeah, that's why I started to check the date. I was like, wait, what day is it? Um, but yeah, Matthew Mott, who was the women's coach, made the move over to England. So yes. that was also the the big, the first big surprise. I think that one was very. I'm still processing it, honestly. Um, yeah, I'm still processing it. It's a sad time to see Moddy leave after so much success and how much time and how much effort he's put into that team to make him successful. So now Moddy will be very missed. Yeah, and look, his tactics and his coaching has clearly worked for for the Australian women's cricket team because they've just been unbeatable the past couple of years. So look, we'll see if whether it's him or whether it's the players um, mm-hmm. as, he, as he moves over. So that will be definitely um, something to, to keep our eyes on. Um, and then Shelley Nitschke has come in as the interim coach for Australia. Yes, um, yeah, um, very good. Shelley, yeah. uh, huge knowledge of the mm-hmm. game and a very good coach. Yeah, well, Shelley was around the Strikers for a long time and is also mm. signed, a, I think it's either a two or three year contract with the Scorchers. So she's been over there and she's sticking with them. So um, that's very good for them and very good for Australia as well because she's a brilliant player and coach. So Yes, um, fantastic. Yeah, and then also Julia Price was USA coach. Um, mm-hmm. She isn't anymore. She's um, not affiliated with USA at all. So that's another name out there, um, which I think, you know, could she could she go somewhere? Um, it'll be interesting to see if she gets a, a coaching gig somewhere. No, yeah, I, she'll definitely get opportunity elsewhere. Um, New World over there um, with cricket, so good for Julia setting up but now she can probably go somewhere where it's a bit more familiar and she'll be stronger for it mm-hmm. for sure yeah definitely um but yeah that's I think majority of the coach move arounds that we've had yeah, um yeah. Uh, well apart from Brendan McCullum obviously <laughs> going over to England um, and the streak testing. is broken yeah what, England beat New Zealand the what a turnover night. what yeah, a turnover I and mean, it comes like Jimmy Anderson and Stuart Broad you've got to have them in the team yeah, I think it was just like one of those games where you're like, and that is why you don't take them out. No, I mean, they they can still play. They can still bowl at their best. Yeah. Let them tell you when they're done, not selection. So that's fantastic. So super interesting. Well, it's great, I guess, to see, you know, that streak from England has been broken and it will be interesting to see what happens in the next test. Yes, will I'm... be. Yep. Yeah, very interested to see that. Although it's just so weird seeing Brendan McCullum be so excited to <laughs> win against the team that he played for. Like it's just a it bit. Is. It's a bit strange. And considering that he retired not that long ago, yeah. So it, it did, no, I know what you mean. It feels fresh and kind of weird, like yeah. a parallel world almost. Yeah, it's it's very weird. I mean, I still haven't wrapped my head around all the Australian cricket coach moving that's happened at the moment. <laughs> um. Still trying to fully process all that. But, yeah, moving on from that, um, there's been a couple of Charlotte Edwards Cup games. It's on to finals now. You'd be happy, Josh, that the Vipers are automatically through to the grand finals. Yes, they've done very well. Yeah. Vipers, um, so good to see. 
Yeah, very good to see. Um, but I think they're still deciding on who is going to go through. I think it's between a couple of other teams on who's going to meet them yes. in the final. I think there's a couple of semi-finals um, still to go as well. So that'll be interesting to see who's going on there. I think Central Sparks do still have a chance of making the final there. So fingers crossed. Yep. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's all the cricket. Now we have another guest this week, Josh. Yes, very exciting guest. Our first umpire. Yeah, so the two big female Australian cricket umpires are Eloise Sheridan, who we spoke to, and Claire Polisak. So they umpire a lot of cricket games together, but we were lucky enough to have a chat to Eloise, um, who was also a school teacher. So juggling school and umpiring international cricket. So she talked to us about how she juggles the two, her favourite games that she's umpired and how she first got into umpiring. So yeah, great umpire. And we've been lucky enough to see her umpire a lot of WBBL games in the past. Yes. And she recently just umpired in the World Cup, which she umpired the semi-final between England and South Africa. So she also talked to us about that and what it's like to umpire in a World Cup. So enjoy our interview with Eloise Sheridan. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. So can you just talk to us a little bit about how you very first got involved in cricket itself and then on to umpiring? Sure. Um, so I started playing cricket when I was about 12. So I actually was a gymnast before uh, playing cricket and I had quite a bad uh, neck injury. I uh, went to a physio who ended up being one of the state players here in South Australia. And she said, oh, if you're looking for a new sport, come out and, and try cricket. So I did. Um, so I went to a women's or a girls uh, workshop and I was the only girl who turned up. So she said, I'll come over to training. Um, so I ended up training with the senior girls that night and um, yeah, I sort of played from there. Um, and then I, I played for 16 seasons here in South Australia in primary cricket. Um, and I, I played under 17s, under 19s um, for state and then um, sort of had enough and got into my teaching career. Couldn't really keep it going. Um, had some time off and then got back into umpiring. Oh, which Premier Club did you play for? <laughs> uh, well, I started in Northern Districts um, and then I, I did move around a little bit. So then I went to Sturt for seven years and that was my longest stint. Um, and then I finished up at Kensington when they got a women's team. So I was a little bit closer to home. So <laughs> yeah, That's the best one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won premierships at all three. So I'm happy with all three. Ooh. All three were, were successful, so. Very good. That is a very successful career. That's yeah. awesome. So you mentioned there about teaching and umpiring. So how do you balance the kind of teaching and umpiring when it's cricket season here? Yeah, look, it's really busy in cricket season. Um, it's probably a little bit easier when I was just doing primary cricket because I could um, do my games on a weekend, do my training during the week in the evenings. And it's it works quite well around teaching. Um, now that I'm getting into sort of more national and international stuff, it gets a little bit more difficult. I'm really lucky that the school that I'm at at the moment is really supportive. Um, so they gave me most of term one off to be able to do the Ashes in the World Cup. Um, but it, it does get tricky at times and there's certain appointments that I do have to say no to, um, particularly if they're midweek, but generally they're pretty good about it. What made you want to switch to umpiring? I guess it looks very tricky, like I'd never be able to do umpiring. So what made you kind of want to switch over to that? Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question. I, I'm not sure I exactly know the answer to it. Um, so obviously I had you know, pretty good success as a player and I, I knew it was about time to retire. Um, and then for some reason I decided I wanted to take up my weekends again with cricket. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want to get into coaching because it's really similar to, to what, my, what I do in my teaching. So I wanted to try something a little bit different. And I'm kind of someone who watches the game and, and I'll just say, oh, that's out or that's not out. And my partner actually said, maybe you should take up umpiring. Um, so I went and did the level one course and, and it's kind of just snowballed from there. Well, you've progressed through and you've umpired some pretty big games. So we will get around to in a moment. But what did you kind of start off with and what was like your progression through the umpiring pathway, I guess? Sure. So um, I guess once you do your level one accreditation, you can kind of choose the association that you want to go to. And because I'd already been in Premier Cricket, I decided I wanted to go into that pathway. Um, and so you start with the junior boys and I started with some under 14s and under 16s. And uh, I'd only just come out of women, so I didn't want to go straight into umpiring women's cricket as I knew pretty much every player out there. So I ended up going down the male pathway um, and did some third grade. I kind of jumped from 16s up into to third grade. Um, and I was kind of there for about a season. 
And then I was really lucky that the coach, um, the umpire coach at Saka at the time saw something in me. So he put me onto the panel too. Um, and so I did, I think, three games in second grade the next season. And then he put me straight into first grade, which was you know, a big jump, but it was, it was really exciting at the time. And then once I'd done a season in first grade, I was put on the South Australian state panel. Um, and within all of that, I was also able to do some underage championships. So I started with the under 18 females um, and then I went to the under, the under 15s happened to be in Adelaide. So I ended up doing that in the same season as well. Um, and then I went to the under 17 male championships and the under 19 male championships all as part of my state panel contract. Um, and then since then, we, we also did WNCL and WBBL matches um, here in Adelaide as part of the state panel. And then I've been really fortunate that last season, Cricket Australia contracted me to the supplementary panel, which sort of puts me up into the next, the next level as well. Um, and just before that happened, the ICC put me on their development panel. And so I was able to go to the uh, T20 World Cup qualifiers in Scotland just before COVID hit. So that was in 2019. Um, and then sort of things sort of slowed down a little bit. Um, but I was lucky I got to go to the WBBL hub in Sydney. I've done some games here in the BBL hubs as well. Um, and so I was still able to progress probably um, a little bit quicker than some other people who were stuck over in the eastern states. We had a lot of cricket here in Adelaide, which really helped my career. Yeah, so you mentioned that um, you were part of the SA panel and now recently you've been upgraded to the international panel. What is an umpire panel? It's a great question. Yeah, I guess it's a little bit like a team. So um, here in Adelaide, I've been on the first grade panel for a, a few years. Um, so I'm sort of first grade panel plus, plus I'm the South Australian panel, but I'm also on the on the other two as well. So um, I, I kind of look at them a little bit like having a bit of a team. Um, so here in, in SA, we've got 14 on our first grade panel. And so those 14 umpires would generally umpire all of the first grade men's games that weekend. And then it might be made up of some umpires from panel two, or we've got a development panel who can get sort of jumped up as well. Um, just depends on the numbers, who's available. You know, often some people might be away or injured or something like that. So kind of get, get moved around a little bit. Um, and same goes with the state panels. So each state and territory has a panel. Um, and so we do the WNCL, WBBL. And if there's some men's second 11, which we haven't had for a couple of seasons very much, but hopefully that's coming back soon. So we generally do those games. And then supplementary panel, um, is kind of the next level I guess you, it's kind of in between so you've got the national panel who do really all of your shield marsh cup BBL games and then the supplementary panel will service some of those and also some of the um, WBBL and WNCL so you kind of jump between the two yeah no, that makes sense yeah yeah, because yeah, well I saw it on how it got announced on Saka a um, couple of days ago and I was just like the wording just makes it sound so confusing so I was like, we've got to we've got to clarify and check what that is because I definitely think there's a whole different language to umpiring than there is to playing. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I think the importance of having not only female players as role models for younger boys and girls, but I think it is also super important for young boys and girls to see female umpires and coaches. So being a part of that and being able to umpire in international matches, is that something that you can kind of agree with? And what's your thoughts on being like a visible female umpire? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm really excited where um, cricket is heading at the moment and, and not just women's cricket, but cricket in general. Um, I'm, I obviously come from a women's cricket background, so I, I love umpiring women's cricket. It's sort of where I feel at home. Um, and I think it was a fantastic step forward at the recent World Cup that half of the officials were all female, um, plus two of the three match referees were female as well. And then to have all females in the final um, on field and in the box and, and as a match referee is just a huge step forward. I think there's still further we can go as well. So um, I think it's great that we get noticed probably a little bit more than some of the male umpires and it. It probably brings a new a new um, audience to umpiring, which is really nice. Um, so understanding what we do, because as a player, you definitely have no idea what the umpires have to do in preparation for a game or even during a game. I definitely wouldn't have expected what I have to do now when I got into it. Um, but I think there's more steps to be made as well. And I, I'd like to see more females in male cricket as well. I think um, there's some really good steps happening over in England and in the West Indies where there's some of their umpires and even in New Zealand as well, some of their um, female umpires are umpiring men's first class cricket, which I think is probably the next step that we need to go through here as well. I think there's opportunities to do that and hopefully coming up. Um, and then that will 
I guess, help to uh, broaden that idea of being a role model for younger children as well. Um, and really just breaking down those barriers. You know, we get treated just the same when we're out there in men's cricket than the male umpire does as well. So there's really no difference as long as you can um, let your umpire do the talking. I think that's the best way forward. Yeah, it's, it's not like there's a barrier that says, oh, female umpires have to umpire female cricket and men have to umpire men. So it's oh, good. Yeah. Hopefully, like you said, hopefully we do see more females yeah. umpiring first class here. Yeah, I think maybe in the past it's been an expectation that women would probably go into women's cricket and, and it's probably happened in other sports that way as well. Um, but even in if we look at um, at the at the World Cup for soccer, we can see that I think there were eight female um, umpires appointed to that and that's a huge step forward for sport in general. And I think that's something that is probably easier to do in a sport like cricket where we're not as involved in the game. Um, it's it's something that anyone can really do. So I think it's a, a way that we could move forward and, and close that gap. You've built up quite a big list of achievements that you've had with your umpiring. And like you said, men's first class matches and, and a Premier Cricket final. So taking part in those men's matches, what did that experience kind of mean to you? Yeah, it's, it's different. Um, I've kind of had a bit of a, an interesting journey. I, I think I said before how I, I didn't get straight into women's cricket because I obviously come from that pathway. Um, so men's cricket was kind of how I became an umpire and how I developed my processes. Um, and I think that stands me in good stead moving forward. Um, it's probably not a popular opinion, but women's cricket is a little bit different to umpire in terms of there's really not a lot of behaviour issues, whereas when you get to men's cricket, there's a little bit more that you have to deal with in terms of the behaviour and the relationships on the field. So it's just a different um, different type of cricket to umpire. Um, so I think I'm able to deal with situations that happen on the pitch a little bit better in men's cricket, and that kind of filters down into women's cricket as well. And I think that's where my teaching background comes into it as well. There's quite a few teachers that are umpires and we kind of know how to handle um, particularly lots of groups of men out there. So um, I think that that helps me. Um, yeah, I guess in terms of moving forward, I'd like to keep breaking down um, sort of those, those spots that perhaps women haven't always traditionally been a part of. And I don't think that there's any, any issues in us doing that. And you also umpired and still umpire quite a lot with Claire Polisak as well. So um, what's it like umpiring alongside her and some of the matches that you have and, and having, you know, another Australian to umpire with? Oh, it's fantastic. Um, I think when I first started, I, I went to the under 18s and Claire actually contact, contacted me just before and said, oh, congratulations on your appointment. And it was a really big moment for me because I knew who she was and, and to get that acknowledgement was, was fantastic from someone who's already broken down a lot of those barriers and, now that I've umpired with her a fair bit, and particularly this season, we've done the India series, the Ashes and the World Cup all together. You know, I definitely count her as one of my friends. So we had just had the most amazing time out in the middle, in the semi-final at the World Cup. It was just, yeah, just a lot of fun. Um, and someone that I know I can rely on when I'm out there. Um, and having an Australian out there as well, it, it makes it easier to, I guess, be part of an international group um, and, and be out there and be comfortable. Did you have anybody that, aside from her, maybe that you knew about that kind of made you want to umpire, if that makes sense? Good question. I guess um, before I started umpiring, probably not. I don't know if I really sort of looked at the umpires when I was playing. Um, but then when I started umpiring, um, sort of the local person here is Simon Fry. He's only just retired in the last couple of years, but he was just someone that's really well respected within the umpiring community. He's now a match referee. Um, so I still have a lot to do with him as well. But he he went on to umpire um, test matches from a national panel, which is kind of unusual. It's it's probably happened in the last 12 months, a little bit more with the COVID situation. But at the time that he did that, he really broke down some barriers there for male umpires because he wasn't an elite panel. He was an in, international panel. So it was yeah, we're going back to those panels, but it's it's a little bit complicated in how those politics work. So he was able to break down a lot of that. He did a lot of international cricket, perhaps from a level that wasn't expected at the time. And I think that was um, really inspirational and particularly coming from South Australia, which isn't always renowned for our, our uh, I guess, our cricketing prowess. Sometimes we don't do as well as some of the eastern states who have more people. Um, I think that was a really inspiring thing to, to be able to walk into the soccer and meet him. Um, and he's been able to mentor me since I started. Yeah, that's a good mentor to learn from, Simon Fry. He's a very good guy. Also, you talked about, I've heard a few times, match referee and the different things. So we all know the umpire 
the two umpires on field and then the third umpire. But can you kind of break down what the match referee, the fourth umpire does, and is there anything else? <laughs> yeah, so generally we'll have what we call a PCT or a player control team. Um, so that would be the four umpires and a match referee. So that would be pretty much from, um, I'm trying to think, BBL, Marsh Cup, those sorts of, and Shield cricket sometimes. Um, and then definitely international cricket, we'd have that sort of group. Um, so we've got our two on-field umpires, the third umpire in the box. The fourth umpire is kind of like our reserve or emergency umpire, but they also play a really key role. So they generally get to the ground a little bit earlier. They'll look after the pitch, make sure everything's ready to go, make sure we've got all the balls ready, the radio comms are all ready to go. They generally are the liaison with the ground staff. So particularly on a wet weather day, it can be a really busy job. Um, I was actually fourth umpire for the India test up on the Gold Coast where it rained for a couple of days. So That was a great one. <laughs> Yeah, one of my jobs was to count the time between the thunder and the lightning because that's dependent on when we can go back on. So, you know, that was an interesting fourth umpire gig to have. Um, and then I'll take out drinks if there's a drinks break and things like that. And often there'll be the liaison between the coaches um, and the on-field umpires or the match referee. So any questions would go through that fourth umpire. Um, the match referee is kind of like, I guess, the overall controller of the game. Um, so they're making sure that everything is running smoothly. They'll do the toss before the game, make sure the team sheets are correct. So they kind of do that admin side of things. And then if anything happens during the day, during the game, um, they might do some code of conduct at the end. Um, so, if, yeah, if they have to follow up any reporting, that would go through the match referee. They also provide us with lots of feedback as well. So they'll run our um, post-match meetings after a game and sort of go through, okay, what observations did I have and, and what did you have and run through any like decision-making or processes that we might need to improve on for the future. That, that's a really, I love that. You, you counted the time between the thunder and the light. That's fantastic. I mean, you just, you'd never, ever think that a, I would do that. So that, that's a great insight there. Yeah, so definitely things that, as I mentioned before, things you don't think of, you definitely have to do them in umpiring. <laughs> yeah, that, that's fantastic. Now, you and Claire were also both the two first female umpires here in Australia to umpire a professional match together um, in the WBBL. So how much did that kind of mean to you and maybe both of you to have that kind of recognition? Because I remember seeing it and just going, wow, you know, it's, it's two girls. I think that was a really good step. So how did you feel about that I think it was a really big moment I actually from memory I think that was the first game I'd umpired with Claire so uh, I was nervous about umpiring with her with um, a bit of a role model for myself it was also and, and the, sorry it was on Adelaide Oval which is obviously my home ground so I, I love umpiring there I think I'd only done maybe one or two games umpiring there before so it was kind of a new experience um I had a lot of family and friends there which was fantastic as well we knew there was a little bit of I guess, media scrutiny around it because it, it was kind of played out um, in the media a little bit as well. Um, but I think in the end, we just umpired well. The players responded really well. Um, I think if you can build the relationships with the players, it makes it a lot easier once you're out there, uh, makes us a lot more confident. We, as I said, we've made our relationship really strong in terms of our umpiring together. So I think that happened from that first game. We were able to trust each other and, and what we were doing. So, yeah, I really enjoyed the, the match. And it's kind of really nice that my last match was actually the World Cup semi final with Claire. And it's a yeah, fantastic memory. So. Yeah, you touched on our relationships. So are you, are you allowed to build a relationship with the players at all? Or is there, is there just like a, a line, I guess, that you... Uh, is there any there you, if you know what I mean yeah. yeah yeah I do um yes and no like I I probably I wouldn't go and I'm not someone who would go and have a beer with a, a player after a game but I know some players in primary cricket too um probably a little bit harder at national and international level um but definitely you can have a chat on the field um if someone wants to have a chat um you know have a little bit of a joke with some players as well always sort of breaks the ice a little bit better yeah, it's good. Is there anything in particular that you need to know in advance before the games about certain things? Yeah, definitely. We have a bit of a, I don't, I don't want to give away all of our secrets, but we do have a bit of a mechanism that we kind of pass on information if it's relevant, particularly if we're in a tournament. So maybe an underage championship or the WBBL or BBL will kind of send around. We've got often got little groups of umpires that umpire those tournaments. Um, so we'll send out around messages and just say, oh, 
in this game, so-and-so did this, maybe keep an eye out for that in the next game. Sometimes it's practical things like, oh, they got really close on the front foot. Um, so keep an eye on that. Um, other times it might be that they got upset about something and if they cross the line, maybe check on that for the next game or something like that. So yes, there are definitely ways that we we go about doing that. On the topic of kind of what you said there, Josh, the, the rule is, you know, usually in most sports is don't argue with the umpire. Has there ever <laughs> been a situation where someone's argued? And if so, how do you deal with that? And what is the strategy to kind of deal with that because you have to make the decisions and you have to be confident in your decisions yeah look absolutely um I think it's in our nature to talk back and I was definitely guilty of it myself sometimes as a player so I understand where players are coming from so I think I've got that advantage um it depends on the player and depends on what their reaction might be so sometimes I try and ignore it um and that will sort of get them away and they'll just they'll just move on if they don't get a reaction um, other times I might say something back to them um, and then that might I try and do it uh, fairly succinctly and um, make it you know pretty straightforward but I'm what I'm wanting out of the situation like go back and bowl or something like that um, let's get on with the game um, if it escalates a little bit more we can also use our partner on the field so I might go over to square leg and and sort of bring my partner into the conversation and that generally diffuses any situation if that still doesn't doesn't work, sometimes we get the book out and say, all right, I'm going to put you on report if you don't stop talking now. And that definitely nine times out of 10 will stop any any arguments in their tracks. Um, and then obviously, if that doesn't work, we do have to report them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we see we see in the men's game, not, not so much in the women's game. I don't think I've ever really seen anything. No, I mean, the um, infamous uh, Virat Kohli and Tim Payne little mm-hmm. battle. And then we've got Nigel Long going, guys, let's just play the game. I'm yes. just like, that's, that's really good. Just like, just we're not children. And with your teaching background, I'm sure that would hold you in good stead as well. Absolutely. And I think it's a little bit like in AFL, the umpire just throw the ball up again and let's get on with it. So we try and we'll try and use that tactic a little bit as well. Can we get a rule in and say umpire descent, like minus five runs, whatever? <laughs> well, I don't know how that will go down, but it's definitely <laughs> worth the thought. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if it'll, I'm not sure if players will agree to that. Let's keep that out of cricket. <laughs> <laughs> um so you also mentioned a little bit earlier on about the women's ashes. Now you did the the test match, which was so amazing to watch, even though it was a draw. So what was that like umpiring that, that test match? Uh, my favorite game that I've ever umpired, to be honest. Um, I've always um, I've always said when people ask, oh, what kind of game do you want to umpire? Like, what's your goal? It's always been a test match. And definitely on top of that, I'd say an ashes test match. And then to do that this season was fantastic and to make my debut in, a, in an Ashes Test match, I, I was just so excited every single morning, um, all four days. I knew that something was going to happen. Um, I, I somehow managed to sleep. I'm not sure how, um, but I would just jump out of bed each morning. I was I don't often get nervous before a game, but I, I was the most excited I've ever been before that game. Um, and then it, it was kind of the game that had everything. So we had a sort of a, I guess, a bit of a... Uh, stalemate on day one then we had a bit of rain um and then on that last day yeah any result was possible up until that last over and uh, I was happy to be standing at square lake um I didn't really want to be at the bowler's end with Alana King bowling the last over uh, but then she bowled a full toss on the last ball and I thought oh no I have to make a decision here as well but um luckily it was a pretty clear one so that was okay it was dropping it was dropping, it was dropping <laughs> so all good um yeah, just super excited. And I think it's one of those games that really promotes women's cricket, but not only that, in, it promotes test match cricket as well. And hopefully we can get some more women's test matches going because I think that's, for me, as a, as a cricket purist, that's the best form of cricket is, is to fight that battle over the four days in women's, in women's test matches. And I think there's one coming up in England um, over the winter for us. And I think that's going to be a really exciting match to get South Africa back in the test arena. And hopefully we can do that with more countries as well. Yeah. yeah, and it's really a good spark of debate with um, it needs to be five days or is there room for like four-day cricket at the state level? So mm-hmm. it's good that it kind of sparked that debate. So it just gets people thinking and hopefully gets up to the hierarchies and say, oh, wait, maybe we need to do it. Yeah, and I think that's already been shown in the fact that the WNCL season has been extended. So I think, you know, hopefully the bosses are thinking about it and getting some more time into women's cricket. Yeah, yeah. sure. 
and like you said there it's clearly people are thinking about it and aware of it so hopefully it just keeps on progressing more and more yeah. and and I mean like you said before it was just even though it was a draw and there wasn't a result it still felt like such a just a good match to watch so I think it's a really really good thing for women's cricket but what was your daily routine for that test match I'm curious as to what you know your step by step was from morning to night during that test match I don't really think about that um so we were still kind of in a semi-bubble at the time in Canberra so first thing I had to get up and do a rat test every morning um and then I had to wait for that result go down and have breakfast with everyone um then I would I'd normally pack my bag the night before so making sure all my uniform is there I have gone to a game without a pair of pants before so I always make sure that I pack numerous pairs of pants and numerous shirts and everything that I need um so I generally do it the night before but I'll double check it in the morning just in case um um I'm trying to think once I'm in the game Maybe on the first day, I would look through the playing conditions again, just to make sure I'm on top of everything. I take notes out on the field with me as well, just in case I need a reminder. And test matches are a little bit different because I haven't done a lot of four-day cricket. I need to know a little bit more about the times and sort of when we go off and things like that. It's, yeah, a little bit more to know. Um, so I do that generally before the first day. But after that, I'd probably just trust that I know what I'm doing. Um then yeah obviously get changed we normally get to the ground about an hour and a half before the game particularly on the first day and then we'd sort of get into the change rooms um the fourth umpire would probably already be out at the pitch and then we'd go and meet the fourth umpire out there talk with the groundsman or the ground staff around what the pitch is looking like is there any weather around generally um we're not locals and so we'd, we'd ask the local ground staff what their opinion is and what's what's happening um they generally know their pitches pretty well so got to know that it's probably a little bit slow but it's going to have a good good amount of bounce so that might help us particularly in the first few overs to know um i guess how the ball is going to be tracking and that sort of thing um then we'd, we'd actually have a bit of downtime so we'd sort of head back into the change rooms um have a bit of a chat a bit of food before the game um, obviously get changed put our sunscreen on and do all of that and then yeah head out to the game and it's kind of just that same routine each morning it's super interesting I mean it's very like you said very step by step now I don't know this has come across as like I'm not very interested in cricket but I'm powering a test match now my attention span could not do it so <laughs> is it tricky in any kind of way to stay on the like to stay focused yeah and I guess the test match is particularly in women's cricket it's 100 overs a day which is a long day um, but then it, so is a one day game. So kind of thought of it as four one day games in four days and tried to sort of make my brain think of it that way. Um, the advantage with a test match is you get two breaks, whereas in a one day game, you only normally get one break. Um, so I think once we've done um, of some more of those one day games before or leading up to a longer, longer version, it makes it a little bit easier because you've generally practiced having an attention span for about three to three and a half hours in a session for 50 overs, whereas in a test match, it's two or two and a half hours. So it's a little bit easier. Um, we definitely switch off a little bit in between balls and that takes some practice as well. Um, so kind of got our, if you ever watch the umpires, you'll be able to see that they kind of move around between balls just to, I guess, switch off and then switch back on once the ball is ready to go. Um, and then at square leg, you can obviously switch off a little bit more as well. But then as the bowler starts coming, you've got to switch yourself back on. I think it's just getting into a routine, getting into practice with that. But yeah, there's definitely moments where you might sway a little bit. I always take some lollies out there with me as well if I need them. So that can give me a little sugar hit if I need it. Yeah, you don't want, you don't want the bowler to run in and go, oh, butterfly. Oh, wait a no. minute. <laughs> <laughs> So you also mentioned a little bit earlier on about the Women's World Cup. Now, that's such a big event. So did you feel, I guess, maybe a bit more pressure? Yeah, I guess so, because you know that obviously people from around the world are watching. It's, you know, a high profile event and it's going to have wider impacts. So how, how, we, how we perform out there. Um, at the same time, though, I was the only kind of new umpire to World Cups in the whole um, group so all the other 11 umpires had all umpired some sort of World Cup whether it was men's or women's um, so I kind of went in there come having come off the ashes where I thought I, I performed pretty strongly um, I was able to go in there really confident and I really had nothing to lose because I was the new person so hopefully that showed in my performances as well. Did you have any moments where I guess like I said earlier you have to be confident so are there any points where you're like really umming and ahhing and unsure whether you've made the right decision or anything like that? 
generally I'm pretty confident with my my decision making but with DRS it's kind of shifted things a little bit so I've only had it in the ashes in the world cup um there was there's probably one I had one error in the semi-final uh but that was my only error for the tournament which was you know a really great thing for my confidence um but there was a game I had it was the West Indies versus India in Hamilton um I think it was uh, Rajesh Rawari guy quarters bowling um to one of the West Indian girls and I've given her out LBW and she's sort of thought about it. I think there was only about three seconds left on the clock and her partner saying, oh, well, you've got two reviews. We might as well review it. And so they sent it up and then it's come up on the screen and I've gone, oh, no, she's moved across more than I thought she has. Well, oh, she might be outside the line here for the impact. I've gone, oh, no. And then the, the ball tracking's come up and it's actually said umpire's call and then it was umpire's call hitting the, the wickets as well. Um, so that's the first time I've had that. Um, but that was probably the only real moment where I sort of heart in mouth. I went, oh, no, I've made an error here. Um, but otherwise, I think, yeah, it's it's pretty good. And and I'm, yeah, generally pretty confident with my decision making. So not, not too many nerves on that. With the umpire's call, is the DRS like allowing, because the umpire can see it a lot clearer than I guess the ball tracking can. Is that what it allows it for? Yeah. And I guess there's always human error in the ball tracking as well. So it can never be 100% certain. And that's where the umpire's call comes in. Um, sometimes it can be something as, as silly as a gust of wind will slightly move the camera. Um, and so that might just shift that umpire's call a little bit. So it gives us a little bit of leeway um, to just kind of trust our judgment on those. Yeah, Do you have any highlights from doing that World Cup or something that you really, really enjoyed in that experience? Yeah, probably my favourite, oh, I've got a couple now that I think about it. Um, my my biggest performance is that I was, you know, lucky enough to see out on the field um, for that. Actually, it was that India-West Indies game as well. Um, there were two centuries in that game. So I think it was Harman Prekor and Smriti Mandana both made centuries. And to see that in the same game is is unusual. So it was really nice to see some really just clean hitting. Um, the pitch played really true that, that day. And then the West Indies came out and Deandre Dutton was hitting the ball ridiculously hard, probably the hardest I've ever seen a female hit a ball. And I thought, well, maybe they're, they're on here. I think they were none for 100 at one stage. And I thought maybe they were going to chase this down, but India came back. So just being able to see the, the kind of hitting um, from the girls that day, I think that was really nice to see. Um, probably my other favourite performance would be in the in the semi final with Sophie Eccleston. I think her bowling really changed that match, and even Danny Wyatt's batting on the day. I think without her score, perhaps it would have been a lot closer. Um, so a couple of big performances, you know, in that pressure situation. I think you have to stay. Well, obviously you do, but as an umpire, you have to stay very neutral. But are there any moments where you're just like, I don't know whether it's whether you look it or whether you have to kind of contain yourself from looking like you're going to be a bit more biased to either side if that makes sense yeah you've actually just made me think of another favorite moment where um Bangladesh West Indies played together played against each other in Tauranga and Bangladesh almost beat the West Indies and it's it's one of those moments where you're like oh maybe it would be a good thing for the tournament if if Bangladesh win this game Uh, but you've got to just stay focused on what's what's ahead of you um so I think in that game I gave an LBW that was reviewed and I I thought, oh, I hope that isn't seen in a particular way. Um, but it, it was obviously confirmed, so kind of backs us in a little bit, which is nice about the DRS. Um, but definitely you've got to, I guess, make sure that you're not showing any bias. But I, I don't think any umpires would do that. Um, and, I, and I think the ICC sort of looks after, after us a little bit by not putting us on Australia games. So there's absolutely no question in that regard. With the DRS calls as well, do you kind of go to the player, like if they say, oh, yeah, I want to review this, you're just like, Really? <laughs> all right yep let's do it definitely there was there was one in the in the semi-final where Sophie Eccleston convinced Heather Knight to go upstairs and everyone's <laughs> like no she's definitely hit that and Sophie's like no no we've got to go up and so they she said okay well we've got two reviews we'll go up and it just came clean off the middle of the bat and look it's it's one of those ones where you go I'm pretty sure I saw what I thought I saw um, so it's nice for that to come up on the screen and be confirmed and she definitely copped a little bit from the rest of the girls out there that was <laughs> hilarious I remember watching that and she looked so embarrassed like she was head in hands red and she was like I can't believe I've just done this yeah um, <laughs> I had a question here about your favourite umpiring memory, but I guess you kind of touched on that one. Do you have any other highlights from your umpiring career? Um, I've got I've got quite a few. Um, 
yeah, obviously this season, the Test match and, and the World Cup semi-final, even my first game in the World Cup, I think that was, you know, a great memory as well. Um, previously would be probably my first grade men's debut. I think that was a really big match here. It was kind of the first time that a female had done that um, in South Australia. Um, and then even when Mary and I were the first pair of females to umpire a men's first grade game here in or anywhere in Australia actually um, that was also a big moment and it's really nice um, Mary's one of my best friends so it's really nice to do that with her and, and sort of tick off another box um, but then I've also had other games where it's you know I, I did the, the women's first grade t20 final here in Adelaide I was just happened to be here that week and I said oh can you do this game and I thought oh yeah I could probably do that and it, it was just a really nice nice game to get out there for and um, see some different players. I think Northern Districts came from fourth to win that over Glenelg, who had kind of been the dominant team all year. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's nice to see some players um, get out there and, and some of the younger girls coming through. Like I umpired Darcy Brown in that under-18 championships. I think she was only about 14 at the time and now I've umpired her in a test match. So it's nice to see that progression over the, the last few years. What would you say if someone were to want to do umpiring, but not too sure about, you know, whether it'd be too tricky or is kind of being a bit more of a male dominated environment, what would be your advice on, on getting into the female umpiring game? Yeah, I guess it depends on what you want to achieve out of your umpiring. I think there's a lot of opportunities within that women's cricket space. Um, I would say that umpiring is still quite male dominated. Um, I'll often walk into a meeting and only be one of a handful of females in the room. And that's something that we're trying to improve on. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of female umpires here in South Australia. So it's something that I would encourage anyone to get involved in. So whether you're a past player like myself and you want to get back to the, into the game or give back to the game, um, whether you're someone who just loves watching cricket, it's, it's the best seat in the house to watch from is being out in the middle um, or whether you just want to try something different. I think it's a great opportunity. Um, we're trying to put in place some different things in terms of in, encouraging some females into this into the umpiring world and, and trying to give a little bit more support. I think perhaps in the past, and I think I'm, I'm pretty stubborn, so that's probably why I'm still, you know, I'm still umpiring, but it, when I started, there really wasn't a lot of support in place. And I was really lucky that through Saka, I was put on the development panel pretty quickly. And that gave me some people that I would meet up with once a month and, and some friends within that group who I'm still friends with now. And, and some of them don't umpire anymore, but we still catch up and we still contact each other. Um, so I think it's really important to develop that that base of people and support network. Um, umpiring can be a very lonely place when you're out in the middle, um, particularly if you're by yourself as some umpires are, or if you're only with that one other person. Um, it's about developing, again, developing relationships with people that you're working with um, and seeing it as a challenge because it absolutely is. I'm still learning all the time. Um, we do laws, nights and quizzes, you know, every week. So um, I'm doing TV umpiring every week. I'm, I'm constantly learning and there's there's always changes. We know that there's, the laws of cricket are changing this year. So it's going to sort of make everyone start again on the numbering and all of those sorts of things. So there's always changes happening. So I think if you love learning and you love cricket, it's a great place to be. Yeah, hopefully more females do get involved because I know it makes me extremely happy seeing that kind of representation of professional females in that environment. Now, do you have... I guess it's hard because you've done a lot, but do you have anything where, whether it's a tournament or, or a game that's happened in the past where you've just kind of been like, that is just one game that I just really wanted to umpire, whether it be, you know, the IPL, for example, is there anything like that? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, uh, I guess like the ultimate goal, as I mentioned before, is, is definitely to do a test match at some point. Um, my my most memorable test match, I would have been way too young to umpire it, but was the the Adelaide test match um, that Mike Hussey hit the winning runs on. And I think that was in the last session of day five. You know, a game like that is amazing. Um, and I'm lucky enough that the women's test match was such a close game as well. Um, I guess moving forward, um, you know, I'd love to get into that more first class cricket and, and get into some shield games would probably be the next thing that I'd like to tick off. So, you know, hopefully that will happen at some point. Um, yeah, keep working hard and hopefully the opportunities will come. Yeah, that'd be brilliant to see. So we like to finish off our interviews with some this or that. All right. Our first one, we've got T20 or test cricket? Uh, test cricket. Comedy or horror? Comedy, definitely. I don't like being scared <laughs> if I don't have to be. Fair enough, fair enough. Yep. Um, beach cricket or backyard cricket? Oh, that's a tough choice. Um, 
probably backyard cricket because that's what I was brought up on. It's a very like here or there. People either used to go down to the beach all the time or play with their, you know, Christmas Christmas day in their backyard. It's very um yeah. <laughs> very one sided. Now this one's I guess going back um, back a bit. We usually ask this to players, but I'll still ask it to you. Um, would you rather hit three sixes to win a game or take a hat trick to win a game? Uh, hit three sixes. I was a batter, so I'll definitely go with the sixes. There you go. Um, TV shows or movies? Ooh. Um, it's a harder question than people think. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the time now we watch TV is kind of, we binge it, so it kind of turns yeah. into a long movie. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say movies. Nothing like going to a cinema. Yeah. yeah. I get the whole experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, pineapple on a pizza, yes or no? Uh, definitely yes okay yes what is your go-to <laughs> pizza topping um well i'm actually vegan so whatever the best vegan option is there you go. generally yeah. it does have yeah. pineapple on it yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm very much like a whatever the pizza is and then just plus pineapple yeah. that's <laughs> how it works um would you keep your chocolate in the fridge or in the pantry in the fridge good good that's what we like to hear that's good if we leave it out it's going to melt so that's, true. That's, true. that's all the questions thank you very much for jumping on and joining us it's been really brilliant to hear your perspective something new that we haven't heard before thank you for having me so another great interview it was very interesting to hear such a different perspective that we haven't heard before because you know we've chatted to lots of players and mm -hmm. the player process on game day and we've heard what a game day is like from a coach but to hear it from an umpire now is um yeah it was really really intriguing yes and Eloise Sheridan official lightning counter for Australian yeah. cricket yeah that she should get a badge with that printed on so great and so interesting to hear that like I thought there would be a grounds lines. groundsman yeah job, actually me too. Like, or just wait for the storm to pass. But yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, like we said, so crazy to, to hear. So that was our interview with Eloise Sheridan. We hope you enjoyed it. Next week, we have another guest. It was a bit of a cricket slash AFL interview, if you'd like. <laughs> yes. Um, so we spoke to Melbourne Renegades and now Hawks player, Jess Duffin. Yes. Now, Jess is a Renegades batter and she has been for quite some time now. Also used to play for Australia. Yes. Um, and she, yeah, like we said, plays in the women's AFL. And mm -hmm. she has recently just signed with the Hawks. So that is next week. But in the meantime, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at How's That TCP. Or you can send us an email at How's That The Cricket Podcast at gmail.com. But that is all from me this week. And that's all from me. How's that? Mr.